Hello and good evening, everyone. Welcome to the OSSTF series webinar, The Importance of Not-for-Profit Child Care to Parents in Ontario. I'm happy that, to see everyone tonight and I welcome you to our webinar. Um, I'd like to do a land acknowledgement uh, first off and get us started. Please feel free to put in the chat the land that you're participating from today if you, if you choose. Reconciliation is a deeply personal journey, and I encourage you to learn more about the 94 calls to justice in the report of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. The indignity, injustices, and discrimination that Indigenous peoples continue to endure weakens the fabric of our entire society. Colonization, assimilationist policies, and the scars inflicted by residential schools have damaged cultures and kinships and have resulted in distressing gaps in health outcomes and living conditions between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people. OSSTF is an educational organization which represents teacher and education worker members. Our central office is in the community of Scarborough in Toronto, but we have 35 district offices across Ontario. Please feel free to acknowledge the traditional land that you're participating from today and give thought to the generations of people who are stewards of that land. In the 1950s, when Scarborough was being developed, a Wendat burial site was uncovered on the spot where Tabor Hill Park sits, and that's very close to our provincial office. The Wendat peoples, who the Europeans called the Huron, practiced a special burial ceremony, and they dug out individual graves and cleaned each of the bones thoroughly. And they had a celebration where they dug and filled a trench with the mixed bones. The mound was created when the earth was laid on top to cover the bones. These mounds can be found in different areas across Ontario, and when you encounter one, it is important to remember that you're in the presence of a very sacred space. Today I'm speaking to you from Toronto, which is situated on treaty land that is steeped in rich Indigenous history and home to many First Nations, Inuit, Métis, and mixed ancestry people. I give reverence and recognition as an uninvited guest on this land covered by the Williams Treaty signed with multiple Mississaugas and Chippewa bands. This land was lovingly stewarded by people of the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and we are fortunate to come together today to share this land. Please feel free, as I said, to share and acknowledge in the chat. Thank you. I'd like to proudly introduce Martha Radaway, who is the Vice President of the Ontario Secondary School Teachers Federation. Martha is a proud education worker who has worked as both an education assistant and a, de a developmental service worker in the Greater Essex County District School Board, which is in Windsor area. She was first elected to the Ontario Secondary School Teachers Federation Provincial Executive in 2017 and she was re-elected in 2019. And then in 2021, Martha was elected as one of our vice presidents. After earning her developmental service worker diploma and applied medication certificate from Loyalist College, Martha spent most of her union career as president of the Educational Support Staff Bargaining Unit in the Greater Nine, uh, sorry, in the District Nine Greater Essex area. A staunch activist, Martha has extensive experience working with the broader labor movement as a member of the Windsor and District Labor Council. She is a strong advocate for the full service education team, a membership driven uh, union and a membership driven union. And she continues to work hard to improve the working lives of education workers and teachers to better serve students. As a mother of a strong young woman, and a grandmother-to-be, Martha understands the need for accessible and affordable childcare for working families. It's my pleasure to welcome her here and she will be moderating this evening. Congratulations on the new baby coming, Martha, and becoming a grandmother, and take it away. Thank you so much, Tracy, for that wonderful introduction. It uh, does seem surreal when, uh, you know, somebody reads your biography, but uh, the newly added grandmother-to-be is certainly um, 
my proudest accomplishment to date and I can't wait to welcome my new grandson and and uh, hopefully uh, he will be able to access uh, $10 a day childcare uh, or his mother will be able to access $10 a day childcare here in Ontario and uh, so thank you so much, uh, everybody, for being here this evening. It is my honor to moderate uh, this panel tonight, um, talking about the importance of not-for-profit childcare here in Ontario. Uh, I would like to acknowledge that I am participating um, here in Toronto, and uh, that is on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat people, and is now home to many diverse First Nation, Inuit, and Métis people. Um, I'd like to introduce um, with great honor our panelists this evening. Uh, you will see from the biographies that I read that we are in such amazing company with some strong women who have been advocating for childcare for many years. So, uh, please take the opportunity tonight to ask them any questions while they're here um, about uh, not-for-profit not childcare. I encourage you to uh, put some questions in the chat. Um, if I see that there are going to be some uh, questions that we can ask right away, um, I may do that, but certainly we will leave uh, lots of time at the end to be able to answer any questions that you have. So without further ado, I would like to introduce uh, Sophia Mohammed. Sophia is a registered early childhood educator and a graduate of the Master of Arts in Early Childhood Studies from X University. In her role at the Childhood Research and Resource Unit, she works on several policy and research-based projects in the early childhood education and care sector. She also mentors uh, placement and internship students during their time at the CRRU. And Sophia has a keen and avid interest in um, pan-Canadian childcare policy, the ECEC workforce policy, the care economy, and the devaluation of care work in a heteronormative and neoliberal environment using an intersectional feminist approach. Sophia is also a part-time faculty member at George Brown College in the School of Early Childhood Education, where she creates collaborative learning environments for ECEC students to understand the histories and the current realities of Canadian social policy and ECE policy in Canada. Welcome so much, uh, Sophia. What a pleasure to have you here with us this evening. Uh, Carolyn Ferns is the Public Policy Coordinator at the Ontario Coalition for Better Childcare. She has uh, her bachelor's and master's degree in early childhood studies and is a board member of both Child Care Now and the Child Care Resource and Research Unit. So welcome, uh, Carolyn. Again, such a pleasure to have you here with uh, all of your background and advocacy. And I look forward to uh, hearing from you as well this evening. Uh, Wendy LaRose is a mother of two children, a social justice advocate and the founder and executive director of CTO, Child and Youth Educational Services, where she is currently training um, Ryerson students in community development and advocating for children, youth and families who encounter challenges in Ontario's public education system. In addition, Wendy is also the lead peer parent coordinator for Toronto Parents for Childcare, which works to address systemic childcare issues and advocate for affordable and accessible uh, quality childcare. Um, such an honor to have you as well, Wendy. Um, I had seen an interview that you had done recently um, with uh, Working Ontario Women, and uh, you are such an inspiration and certainly um, a very articulate advocate on, for, on behalf of uh, child care here in Ontario. And uh, Alana Powell is a proud registered early childhood educator and the executive director of the Association of Early Childhood Educators Ontario. She is a care activist who believes in the power of ECEs 
Yes, Alana, and is deeply committed to centering their voices and experiences in the fight for decent work in an early year system that is caring, equitable, transformational, and meets the needs of our communities. So as again, it is my honor and privilege to share this platform uh, with the four of you. Um, uh, I'm very much looking forward to the conversation tonight, and I view this uh, webinar as just that, a conversation about what we can do to ensure that uh, working families uh, here in Ontario, here in Ontario, will have access to $10 a day childcare. So we'll, without further ado, I will go ahead and get started uh, with the questions and uh, please feel free to, um, you know, just elaborate at your own and uh, we'll just continue the conversation from there. So uh, let's get started. Uh, this year, uh, the federal budget did announce and, and finance minister uh, Christina uh, Freeland said um, in this year's presentation of the federal budget that she believes in childcare. Um, this transformational $30 billion investment in childcare was certainly um, a historic moment to ensure working families have access to universally accessible childcare. Um, I was uh, looking at uh, some of the websites uh, with respect to the announcement, and uh, it's certainly clear that child care advocates and activists and, and families have very much uh, applauded the announcement, the federal government announcement. And the Canadian Child Care Federation stated, and I quote, uh, the budget confirms that our decades of advocacy has worked. Statements like universal, accessible, quality, inclusive, affordable, and valued early childhood educators were adopted from all of us who have been persistently called on our governments to build such a publicly funded and supported child care system. So you, uh, the sector and partner organizations, um, who have advocated for a true system uh, for early learning and childcare. Uh, you never gave up. I know that this work has been happening for decades and decades. So I want to say congratulations to all of you because that was a historic um, announcement and investment into universally accessible uh, childcare. So I, I like to describe it as a movement. It was the movement for working families here in Ontario and across the country. And um, I know that several organizations, uh, particularly yourself, Carolyn, with the Ontario Co Coalition uh, for Better Child Care, you have developed uh, roadmaps and how to achieve um, accessible child care and a child care system. So my first question is to, uh, we'll start with you, Carolyn, and then we can maybe go to Sophie, Sophia, Alana, Wendy. If you had the direct ear of the Premier, what advice would you give to Premier Ford regarding how affordable childcare should be implemented here in Ontario and what access to $10 a day childcare means for working families across this province? So I'll turn it over to you, Carolyn. Thank you so much, uh, Martha. That's such a great opening question. If I had the ear of Premier Ford, I, I wish that I did. And uh, if I did, I would say to him, Premier, sign the federal child care agreement. Do it today. Do it immediately. Child care cannot wait. Um, nine other provinces and territories have already signed on. And those families in those provinces are already getting emails, um, letters telling them that their child care fees are going to go down in the new years. Early child educators in those provinces are already getting notices that they're going to have increased wages thanks to the, the federal funding. And there's $10.2 billion or more on the table for Ontario that doesn't have to be cost matched. The benefits that that money could have for our communities, for families, would be an undescribable difference. Um, we would see it happening, rippling across our province and, uh, you know, in improving uh, life in, in, in ways big and small for, for families. It would help their bottom line, certainly. Um, but if we're also able to uh, increase childcare spaces and uh, allow more families to access, 
to them. It's going to be, uh, you know, such a game changer for, for families, for young children. And of course, for the early childhood workforce who have done so much for years, but especially in the pandemic, um, you know, the funding that's on the table could improve their wages and finally allow them to have the decent work and pay that they so richly deserve. So Premier Ford, there is no reason not to act, to sign the deal, sign the deal today. Um, I think that's pretty much what I would say to him. But. Thank you so much, uh, Carolyn. I, I do appreciate that. Um, you know, it is, it is uh, concerning that Ontario is lagging behind uh, nine other provinces in getting this deal done. And so um, I'll turn it over to you, Alana. Uh, what would you say to Premier Ford um, if you were to have uh, his ear for a couple of minutes? Uh, I feel like I have lots to say to Premier Ford. I would certainly uh, echo what Carolyn has already said, that it's time to sign the deal. It was time, you know, four months ago, but here we are. But I think I would also say that it's time for him to really listen to the sector and to listen to families. Ontario's childcare sector knows exactly what needs to happen. Ontario families know exactly what they want, right? We're living the policy decisions of this government and we're living the inequities and injustices that, that those policy decisions create. And we can see the way forward. You know, no one knows better than an early childhood educator working in a program what they need to be able to provide the best quality care and education to young children. Um, so it's time that the premier listens to the sector and, and really takes their advice and moves forward in a way that doesn't just, you know, continue to entrench us in, in the problematic market system we have, right, but really starts to think transformationally about what childcare in Ontario should be and could be. Um, so I would say, yeah, sign the deal, but also listen to the sector. You can, you can borrow our roadmap, which was, you know, developed in consultation with the sector and, and leads a path forward that, that I think offers us hope of a, of a different kind of system. So that's probably one of the first things I would say to him if I had his ear today. <laughs> Thank you so much. And uh, Sophia, how about you? What, what would you have to uh, advise the Premier? Uh, so I think just like Carolyn and Alana have mentioned, and, and I feel like a lot of other um, advocates and researchers and, and everyone kind of in the sector and in the community have said, sign the deal. Like Ontario can't wait any longer. And the fact that we're waiting on 10.2 or 10.2 or more million dollars um, for children, for educators, for families and programs is entirely disheartening. Um, I think a big thing is, is Doug Ford always goes on to say how he's looking to get the best deal for Ontario and how he wants Ontario to get their money's worth. Um, and realistically, um, the expansion of nonprofit childcare is really the single most effective way um, to reach as many children and families as possible with high quality care and ensuring that there's trained staff. Um, and I think I'd really want Doug Ford to know that childcare can no longer really be expanded in an accidental manner. It can't be, oh, hey, I guess we need some childcare here. It really needs to be planned and intentional so that there's public accountability of a stable system, which means that families can depend on this care for their children um, and to contribute to our economy. And, I, and I've said this many times before, it's good for children. It's good for, firstly, it's good for children. It's good for families. It's good for women. And as a result of the pandemic and, and before that too, it's, it's good for our, our economy. Um, I think Doug Ford really needs to, like Elena said, listen to the sector and realize that he really needs to support um, the backbone of educators who are the backbone of quality early learning environments. And we know that educators who work in nonprofit childcare, um, staff turnover is lower. Um, you know, remuneration is higher and overall satisfaction is a lot higher in for those um, educators. So educators who are well supported, they're valued, are less likely to leave um, and contribute to the quality of programs. Thanks so, thanks so much, Sophia. And uh, I will turn it over to you, Wendy. Um, if you were to have Premier Ford's uh, ear, 
five to 10 minutes, what is it that you would ask him? Well, like uh, Alana, Sophia, and Carolyn have mentioned, um, that push for him to sign the National Child Care Agreement. Um, but my question I would have for him would be, what does it take? What will it take for him to actually listen and have an ear to those families, those that are in the mar that are in marginalized communities that are trying to, you know, um, get th get by and trying to get their, you know, um, ch children in childcare and you know, get their bang for their buck. They, they are paying for childcare, but they can't afford it. So what, what will it take? And that would be my question to, to ask him. And I would, of course, listen in to hear what his response is. But of course, I would like to push for him to sign that agreement and find out what is holding, what's holding him back. Thank you so much for that. And, uh, you know, as I started to help my daughter look for uh, childcare options, and it's I, never too early to start when you live in the uh, Toronto area, I was uh, shocked at the uh, monthly cost of childcare and wondering to myself, how is it, you know, that her, her family is going to be able to afford uh, quality uh, childcare here in, in Toronto. And, um, you know, it, it really is uh, concerning that parents are having, and mothers are having to choose to, um, you know, not uh, put their children in daycare and maybe stay home from work longer. And it's creating such a greater um, gender disparity across, uh, you know, the workforce here in Ontario. I had, um, when I was, younger and my daughter was in childcare. Um, living in Windsor, I, I would say I was lucky enough to have access to $13 a day uh, childcare. And as a single mother, I can tell you what that meant uh, to know that my daughter uh, was in a quality childcare programming uh, throughout the day while I was at work. I never had to worry, um, you know, about the care that she was getting. And uh, furthermore, I didn't have to worry about the cost of childcare because $13 a day 20 years ago um, was something, you know, that I could afford. And I can't believe that, uh, you know, the investments haven't come sooner um, than they have already because it really would be a transformational change for many working families across this province. So, you know, what is our next step as childcare advocates? What can we do as partners with all of your organization and as parents to, you know, um, how can we help? What is it that we can do to ensure that Ontario does sign that deal and uh, really does make affordable, universal uh, child care uh, a reality for many families here in Ontario? And, oh, I guess I better ask somebody that question and, and maybe uh, let's start with you, Sophia. We'll start there and we'll uh, maybe then go to Wendy, Alana, and then Carolyn. Great. So um, as Alana and Carolyn have mentioned, uh, the OCBCC and AECEO uh, have released their, their action plan, their roadmap to universal child care in Ontario. Ontario and Child Care Now, uh, which is Canada's Child Care Advocacy Association, has laid out the Affordable Child Care for All plan. And it's a 10-point plan for building a system of early learning and child care um, in Canada. And it's important to realize and, and, and look at the fact that both these action plans really highlight the need for addressing three elements kind of at the same time. First would be accessibility and expanding services um, in the not-for-profit sector, making childcare affordable uh, by reducing fees uh, and funding services uh, operationally, um, and improving quality largely by tackling the childcare workforce issues such as wages and working conditions. And so the question of how can you help as, as community partners, how can families help um, and what can families do uh, is really put pressure on the, on the provincial government to sign that agreement. Um, and it can be done by, uh, you know, the OCBCC and AECEO put out um, 
a mailer today that said, this is how you can take action. And it can be done by emailing, calling, tweeting, writing letters. Uh, it's a collective effort and it's collective advocacy, advocacy that's really gonna move forward. And we know that Doug Ford knows that there is pressure from organizations, but he also needs to know that there's pressure from families, that there's pressure from community partners, that there's pressure from individuals who are currently using a market system that doesn't work. Um, and they need to know that. And we at the Child Care Resource and Research Unit um, send out a weekly newsletter uh, to share this information and share research policy and practice uh, related news um, relating to child care and family policy. And um, I can put that in the link, but you can sign that up. You can sign up on that um, to be informed about that. Uh, we've also created an issue file um, with, um, it's a binder of sorts that has various advocacy and policy tools related to the pan-Canadian child care agreements that have been signed, where people can take a look and see in the different provinces, these are the actions that are taking place. So in Ontario, what actions are we, um, can we contribute to? Um, and I'll also share that in the link um, at the end of the question. Thank you so much. Uh, and I will now, I say, I think I said I was going to Wendy. I, I, I'm not very good at making a list here. So you can, you can jump in and correct me. Um, then Wendy, Alana, and then Carolyn. Um, as uh, Sophia has mentioned, the collective advocacy part or the collective ad advocacy piece is very, very important. It's important because parents who have access to social media platforms like Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, they'll be able to follow us on our pages, follow uh, Ontario Collision for Better Child Care, follow Top for Child Care, which is Toronto Parents for Child Care, which is the group that I run, follow all the organizations that are actually fighting to advocate for families. And I think that another piece is also doing their research. If if there are parents out there that don't really understand exactly what does this universal child care what is it all about? And they're quite concerned and they want to learn more than doing some research so that they can get some information. And then they'll be able to share it with their friends, their family members, people in the laundry room, people in their in their foyer as they're going to check their mail, um, people at school when they're outside their child's school or daycare. But having these conversations with people that are in their communities, I think that is where we need to start. Thank you so much, Wendy. Alana, what is it that we have to do? What is it that we can help AECEO do? Give us uh, some things that I can do as soon as I log off this webinar tonight and maybe talk about, uh, you know, a couple of small things that each of the um, guests can do to help us make uh, child care reality in here in Ontario. Yeah, uh, Martha, I feel like you already you already started to do it tonight when you shared with us that story about your experience with the childcare system. And I think like Wendy just said, advocacy starts with conversations, right? It's really about talking to people, um, sharing your story to, to highlight, you know, the way the system isn't working, the way it's not meeting the needs of children, families, educators, communities. I think, you know, we often, think about advocacy as, you know, having a seat at the table of power. And we're really trying to disrupt that idea because if that worked, we wouldn't be here having this conversation about still needing a national childcare system. It's really ourselves, people, voters, constituents that have power. And I know in our work with early childhood educators um, and childcare workers and, and childcare providers, we really focus on starting with your own experiences because they really show us the gaps um, and they really help people connect to why these issues matter. I can think back to during the federal election, I was having a conversation with my aunt. I'm five months pregnant now and had, you know, just was quite early in my pregnancy then, but already I was starting to have conversations about can we afford to keep our daughter in her childcare program when I have this baby? Do I have to pull her? And why am I making that decision? And what does that mean for our family? And, and what is the cost? And what will be the cost? And my aunt had no idea, you know, what, what these, these decisions were, you know, what we had to consider. Um, and then I think it, 
it allowed her to think differently about the situation and maybe about her how she voted in that election, right? I'll never know. But I think it really starts with those conversations and share your story. That's the best best thing you can do immediately. But, you know, as everyone has noted, we have campaigns going on. Carolyn's got it in the chat. So there's, you know, really distinct things you can do. Uh, but I would really encourage everyone to just, you know, find the power of their own story and their own experiences and, and hone into that. Because like I said already, we live policy, right? They're not two separate things. Um, and being able to make those connections can really help uh, folks see, you know, the value um, and the importance of what we're advocating for together. Thanks, uh, Elena. And before I turn it over to you, Carolyn, for our listeners here uh, this evening, um, you know, signing up to the Ontario Coalition for Better Child Care or the AECEO Facebook pages, um, that would be an excellent place to start as we speak. Um, they have been posting a lot of information, holding a lot of webinars, uh, specifically around uh, universal child care, giving uh, ECEs some real tools to be able to do some advocacy themselves. So. Uh, if you can do one small thing tonight, I would say hit the like button on their Facebook pages. Um, I, I think tonight you have uh, AECO also has a, uh, a series of uh, webinars for ECE specifically. Is it tonight? It is tonight. Yeah. So next week, next week, next week. Okay. Next next week. Week. <laughs> so sign up and, and, and get to the, that, uh, that event next week and and that's one small step here and and, and Carolyn I'll just turn it over to you to talk about uh, next steps and what we can do to help the Ontario Coalition for Better Child Care and uh, maybe include in there how you can become a, a, a member. <laughs> sure um, so I think my I think my fellow panelists have have covered a lot of the things that folks can do big and small and and you know immediately and 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 long term as well. I just put in the chat our um, rising up for child care page because as uh, as Sophia said at the top, we just put out the ACO and the, the coalition just put out a call to action this week because we know that the federal and provincial governments are meeting tomorrow. For the first time really in months to really hammer start to hammer out negotiations we hope um on uh, on the federal child care plan um and so you know it, this is this is a moment where the the provincial government is actually paying attention they're at the table and they need to hear from as many people as possible as loudly as possible that they need to sign the child care deal so we have three actions that we're suggesting for this week and you can choose one or you can do all of them but call premier ford's office and tell him to sign the child care deal it can be as short a message as that um, but you can also as alana said you can put in some of your own story um, we have a social media action of a sign that folks can um, hold up saying why it's important to take action on child care why we need that deal signed and lastly, if you haven't already, you can sign um, our petition. It's just a click um, and it sends an email message directly to Premier Ford and Education Minister Stephen Lecce telling them to sign the child care deal. And I bet that if folks on the call right now um, signed the petition, we would get over 4,900 signatures um, because we're just close to that right now. Um, so those are some things that you can do tonight. But then I would say also long term or not so long term, just looking into next year, we've got a provincial election coming up um, and that is going to be critical. Whether or not the provincial government signs on the line um, this week, next week, by the end of the year, or they drag it into the new year. The truth is that they've been dragged kicking and screaming to the negotiation table. They had never treated childcare as a priority. One of their first actions was to try to cut $80 million from the childcare budget. So this is a government that has never prioritized early learning and childcare. Um, they also are a government with a serious parent problem. Um, and if they don't know it, they should know it. Um, everything from you know, closing schools, um, you know, when they were reopening everything else, uh, shutting down playgrounds when everybody knew that that was not how you uh, solve the pandemic, and now childcare. Um, so, you know, getting organized for the uh, provincial election next June, and that, as you said, Martha, means getting in touch with our organizations. We're planning for an uh, uh, election campaign, and we'd love you all to join us. 
Absolutely. I mean, childcare has to be a ballot issue for this government. They have to be held accountable accountable on proper implementation of uh, child care should they sign a deal. So, um, you know, the work is not over. We still have lots of work to do. But collectively, you know, we can make a difference and we can hold uh, those um, that are elected accountable. I've always said, um, you know, the government is supposed to work for people when they need it most. And uh, working families here in Ontario need access to quality, affordable childcare. And this government can't continue to turn a, a blind eye to the people that have um, continued to make this province run throughout the pandemic. And, uh, you know, we need, we need um, each candidate running to uh, vocalize where they stand on proper implementation. So glad to uh, certainly uh, make sure that I talk to as many people as I can about this important issue and uh, certainly what it means, as I said, for, um, for working families. So I'm just gonna go to a question in the chat. I did put it in here for the panelists in case you haven't seen it. And uh, this is from Martha. So I don't know why I picked Martha's question, but uh, Martha, you're up first. So the question was, if Ontario accepts the deal, how long do you think it will take to, to get to $10 a day childcare? Is there enough infrastructure in place, such as physical space and enough ECEs to handle um, an increase in the enrollment? And, and further, she asks, what about uh, rural areas of Ontario. So, um, Sophia, do you mind if I go to you on, on this one? Um, and then maybe we could go to, to Alana. Sure. Um, so we know that in order to expand the system, there's a lot that needs to be done. And, and we need to have educators um, to, to fill those new spaces. And a lot of it has to do with growing a system with infrastructure that needs to be created. Um, and I actually think maybe Carolyn and Elena are better um, equipped to speak to this than I am um, from an Ontario perspective. Um, but we really need the funding to do it. Um, and services needed need to be fund op, need to be funded operationally, um, whether that be physical space. Uh, there needs to be training programs that actually support educators um, in order to see that they are able, um, that we are able to open these new spaces and that spaces are going to be of high quality. Um, but I think I'm going to direct the question over to Carolyn and Alana because I think they have a better idea um, in terms of in an Ontario um, scope. Okay, great. Alana, do you want to go for it or? Go for it, Carolyn, get us started. Okay. So how long? Well, I mean, one of the one of the I guess the most frustrating thing is that it feels like right now we're on the province's timeline um, because step one is that we need them to you know sign a childcare agreement. The other thing that's frustrating, of course, is that Ontario has still not produced an action plan, um, which is one of the first things that they needed to do. So you know, as Alana said before, we're happy if they steal our homework because we've done the homework and we have a roadmap to universal childcare in Ontario. Um, so if they unlock the $10.2 billion and, and things can really get started, um, I think the key, one of the most important um, uh, parts of this is to engage municipalities. Um, you know, it's going to be municipalities that are going to be so important in carrying, us, carrying all of this out. They're the service system man managers. They know their communities and they need to be collaborating with families in the childcare sector to plan um, you know, what's needed in, uh, in their communities in terms of expanding childcare. Um, so I think that that's going to be uh, really important. Um, you know, I'm going to leave, I, Elena, I think you can talk um, to the work, workforce specifically. I'm just going to touch on the other part of the question, which is what about, what about rural areas of Ontario? Um, and I think that that's a really important, um, a really important point. Um, of course, you know, Rural Ontario is often, those are often childcare deserts. And the way the market system is set up right now, um, it leaves them that way, right? And, uh, you know, small towns, it's as if, you know, and I've had people say this to me, well, unlicensed childcare is our only, our only choice. 
right? That's that's the choice we have. And it doesn't have to be that way. And, um, you know, a national childcare system can seem big, but it's really about community childcare. And it's about planning, um, publicly planning um, childcare for areas of the province, big and small and urban and rural. Um, and creating childcare programs in small communities is absolutely doable. Um, you know, creating hubs for regulated family childcare is also completely doable. And we can raise the quality of those programs as we do it. Um, so I think that, you know, I think that the reason that there's so much clamor from the community right now, you know, from families, from the sector, from municipalities, from the business community is because we know what a huge piece of work this is to undertake. And that it's, um, you know, unfortunate that we're stuck on the province's timeline right now when so many people are just eager and ready to go. Um, when we saw that federal child care plan announced, you know, people want to get doing this because we know how, how uh, life-changing it's going to be for families. So we really want to get to work. Thank you, uh, Carolyn, for that. I really appreciate it. And, and over to you, uh, Alana, do you have anything to add on to uh, um, what Carolyn has said? Yeah. Um I think I'll start by just saying, you know, rural issues are real. I live in a childcare desert. There is no licensed childcare in my community at all. And when I was trying to find care for my daughter when she was six months, it was just, I mean, impossible. Um, and I think that this is what a planned, publicly funded approach can do, right? It can really address these gaps in a meaningful way. Um, and in terms of the workforce, you know, there's over 57,000 registered early childhood educators in Ontario. So do we have RECEs? Yes, we certainly do. Do we have ECEs who want to continue working for poor wages, working in terrible working conditions? We do not. Um, what we see too, in, in terms of the profession, on average, RECEs are resigning from the profession uh, within about seven years. For those working in licensed childcare, it's three years. So that tells us there's a really clear issue we're addressing or we're facing in the childcare system in terms of retaining uh, registered early childhood educators. In our Forgotten on the Front Lines report, a report we wrote with the uh, OCBCC in the spring, uh, we had surveyed the workforce and over 40 or 42 percent of respondents said they had considered leaving the field since the onset of the pandemic. Because what we've really seen is, you know, the challenging working conditions and low wages have really been exacerbated by you know, new health and safety protocols, changes in their ability to do pedagogical work, and folks are burnt out, and they're tired, um, and they've been giving their heart and souls to care and educate young children, despite the conditions they're working in. Um, so what we really need to do, first and foremost, is address wages and working conditions. I often use the analogy of we have like a bucket, <laughs> and we've got a bunch of holes in the bucket, and money we pour into the bucket for you know uh, new new education programs or professional learning but if educators are continuing to leave the sector our money is just pouring out the bottom of that bucket we need to plug the holes we need to address wages and working conditions and keep our qualified staff in the workforce make sure they're supported to be able to do the pedagogical work that they do and then we fill our bucket with more we know you know pathways to qualifications are an issue it's not easy for folks working in the sector to get their qualifications it's not easy for folks in rural communities indigenous communities to access qualifications and find meaningful work we have to address all of these features but but primarily it starts right now with wages and working conditions to keep folks in the sector, providing that quality care and education and building from there. Thank you. And I, I could not agree with you more. I mean, I, I absolutely agree that one of the pillars has to be, you know, uh, increasing the benchmarks for the funding uh, for wages for early childhood educators. You know, uh, employers in the uh, for profit uh, childcare sector will say that, you know, that's why the wages are so low. They want, they want to make a profit, right? And it is driving people to find employment elsewhere. So absolutely agree that has to be one of the key 
pillars when we do implement um, uh, the, the, the universal child care is making sure that ECEs are recognized and compensated appropriately, because that really is what's going to, you know, uh, uh, retain individuals in, into the sector. And as we start to expand the availability of that, that's absolutely what we're going to need. So uh, thanks for that, Alana. And um, Wendy, did you have anything to add on uh, Martha's question um, with respect to, uh, you know, the, the, the question she asked, like, um, how long will it take um, after we sign the deal? I think it's safe to say that we don't really know how long it might take, but I think that, um, you know, with respect to um, families that don't have uh, uh, childcare right now that's affordable, that who knows in the future that it gives us an opportunity or gives the government an opportunity for them to start opening up more centers. It gives them an opportunity for them to start opening up more classrooms um, and having, um, you know, quality child care available to all families um, across the province. So I think that, um, you know, if the funding is there, um, that gives them an opportunity to start looking at other ways to provide um, services for all families. Thanks so much, uh, Wendy, for that. Um, you know, even before uh, the pandemic hit, um, I would say the progress towards gender equality had been uneven and the impacts of the crisis are now, of any crisis are never gender neutral and COVID-19 certainly is uh, no exception. Uh, we see and we've heard about the gender effects of the COVID-19 crisis and it really did uh, highlight the uneven progress uh, toward gender equality. Uh, the lack of childcare support, uh, as was mentioned, uh, was or is still uh, particularly pro problematic for essential workers who also have uh, care responsibilities. And, you know, um, parents and, and mothers and working families here in Ontario, we are juggling so many things. Uh, we're juggling uh, school, work, careers, promotions, homework, all of it caring for other family members as well. And more importantly, you know, feeding, housing and clothing um, our family. So um, the question that, that I will ask is what will universal childcare uh, here in Ontario, how will that work towards achieving gender equality? And uh, Wendy, maybe I can, I can turn it over to you to start. Sophia, Alana, Carolyn. I think it would allow uh, families, particularly women, um, to be able to go out in the workforce, um, to not sitting at, not have to sit at home and have to care for their children. I'm not saying that that's a problem. I am a mother of two, but I want to be able to, you know, like many other parents, not have to stay at home and, and you know, try to provide programs or pri pr try to do activities with my children that I know that ECEs and support staff in childcare centers are able to do. I know that they have the experience. I know that they have the education. I know that they have the qualifications to be able to do that. What I was just mentioning as a mother of two, I know what it's like staying at home with my children. And I know that it could be challenging for someone that might not have a lot of experience working with children or, or, or trying to provide activities at home. It's a juggle when they have to, you know, try to work from home and try to take care of their child at the same time. And being able to multitask, that could be challenging for a lot of families. And so I think that when childcare, childcare, is a priority and when parents can send their children to daycare and know that they there's experienced staff that could be able to provide these programs and services that is um, something that is very helpful to a lot of women a lot of parents um, rather than them having to struggle while they're at home when there's other um, you know experts that are out there that are willing 
to support our children and provide um, accessible and uh, quality childcare. So I, I definitely think that it will help a lot of families, um, help women to get out into the workforce. I think it will help them to be able to move up the ladder um, in, in their, uh, you know, their jobs. I think that it would provide a lot of satisfaction to a lot of women across the province. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Wendy, for that answer and being patient uh, with my technical issues here. I really appreciate it. Um, so, uh, Alana or Sophia, you were next. Sorry, my apologies. Um, what What does uh, signing on to this plan mean for for working women, and uh, why is it so important for gender equality? So I think care as a whole and and care work has always had this public private divide, and there's always been this idea that care is a private responsibility that occurs in the home and is the responsibility of women and the public you know sector doesn't really interfere in that but what the pandemic really laid bare was the realities that mothers child care workers advocates and researchers have really known for years we all know someone who knows someone who depends on child care um, and when centers closed at the height of the pandemic there was really a scramble to determine what was going to happen to children of essential workers and and what did Ontario and other provinces do and they, they provided care um, child care for essential workers and that too in some provinces for free um, and and that was so that our economy and the essential sectors that we rely on like supply chain sanitation food health care transportation were able to function um, and what maybe the general public didn't really know or, or didn't realize right away is the long-term impact that the lack of access um, to childcare, regardless of the pandemic, has on, on women's labor force participation and women's careers um, and gender equity. And, and many organizations throughout the pandemic have and will continue to say that Canadian women have paid a heavier price than men uh, during the pandemic. And uh, it's the idea that women are going to continue to pay this heavier price in this pandemic induced recession. And in a matter of, of a few weeks, um, you know, COVID-19 really did roll back the clock of, of, I think there was a report that said somewhat of three decades worth of, of, of women's advancement in, in the labor force. I, I believe it was an RBC report, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and the pandemic has really showed that women's family care responsibilities are mo more onerous. Um, centers were operating with smaller class sizes. School-aged children were spending a lot of time at home and, and care work is skilled work. Um, and that's important to realize as well. Um, and although the situation, while it may be temporary as we are seeing employment rates go back up, um, it's forcing women to choose not to work outside their homes and work on their careers. And families should have access to affordable, high quality, early learning. And if they do have that, if women have that, they're more likely to be engaged in the workforce. And by signing this agreement, the province is really showing that they value the work that women are engaging in and that they are contributing to our community, to our economy and to the economic growth and development of Ontario. Again, it's good for children, it's good for women um, and it's good for the workforce. Thank you uh, so much for that and, and, and Carolyn, was it you, I, I going to you next or was I going to Alana? I think it was Alana. Okay. I remember I was the last one. All right, we'll go to Alana. Uh, all right, <laughs> I'll go next. I think, you know, I don't I don't have much to add maybe to what's already been said, but um, I think childcare is particularly interesting because we're also talking about a highly gendered workforce, right? Like not just RCEs, but the entire workforce, 97% women working in early learning and childcare. And what that tells us is that this universal, this universal childcare approach, this federal deal is an opportunity to not just address the inequality that mothers are experiencing, but also those working in the sector. Uh, you know, providing professional pay, decent, decent working conditions, uh, the ability to have only one job, that's transformational for women working in our field. I know I left my frontline RECE job because I was working seven days a week to make ends meet. And there was no chance that my, my husband and I were going to be able to start a family if I stayed in that role. Um, that's not a choice that anybody should have to make. And that's the injustice that mothers are living, the injustice that early childhood educators and childcare workers are living. 
And that's really what's at stake here is the opportunity to, to transform it in a real way. And, and like Sophia said, you know, care is undervalued as women's work. And, and this is an opportunity for us to start to challenge that narrative and to say here, we are building a system that values care, that honors care and recognizes the care responsibilities of everybody involved. Uh, so I think we have a lot of work ahead of us to really tackle those, but I would say immediately what, what we'll see with the rollout of this, this plan is, yeah, more opportunities for mothers, but also for those working in the sector as well. Great, thank you so much. I, and I agree with all of uh, the panelists. I just, um, I want to uh, remind folks about the, you know, the, the work that happened here in Ontario just a few years ago when the previous provincial government had a uh, gender wage gap strategy committee that went around the province and did consultations in communities and talked to, to folks all around, all across the province um, on what would make a difference in the gender wage gap. And after all of their consultations and all of their conversations and all of the people who wrote in and all of the reports that they read, their number one recommendation for action was a universal childcare system. And that was because they heard that it is the underinvestment of government into a universal childcare system that means that both mothers and early childhood educators bear the burden of that underinvestment through high childcare fees and low wages. And you know, we knew that then in Ontario, and then it sort of got, you know, swept to the side as the new government came into to uh, into uh, Queens Park. And I think that right now we have a moment to put that pressure back on, and say, as you know, as Sophia said, the pandemic has has thrown this into sharp relief. Um, but it's something that we've um, we've known in Ontario and we've heard in Ontario for a long time, and it's really. Um, you know, way past time that we acted on it. Absolutely, uh, Carolyn, and thank you everybody uh, for that. And, and just building off a little bit about what was said here with respect to uh, choice. And, the, and you're right, the government does like to talk about giving parents choice. Um, I view that coming from public education as code for, you know, uh, for-profit privatization um, institutions. And, and I would imagine that uh, the word choice in the childcare sector is no different than what it is in uh, publicly funded education. So let's talk about that a little bit more. Um, Patricia here in the chat says, you know, Ontario government talks a lot about giving family choices. So she's hearing the same thing that uh, we are. Um, if there is no accessible childcare, it's not a choice. It's families making whatever arrangements they can to make to work. So let's talk about uh, choice. What's wrong with parents having choice in a child care system here in Ontario. Um, talk to me about, you know, um, uh, for-profit uh, child care institutions. What's the difference? Um, and why, what advice would you give to parents when uh, Minister Lecce is talking about the freedom of choice for them in choosing what's best for their for their children. So maybe Sophia, I'll start with you and uh, then we'll go to Wendy, Alana. <laughs> no, we'll go Carolyn, Alana. Carolyn, you finished last this time. So let's start with you, Sophia. Thank you. I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm like always answering these questions first, um, but- oh, uh, uh Circle back. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it's, I'm, I'm happy to do it. Um, so I think, this idea of providing or, or this idea of choice doesn't really exist when you don't have choices in the first place. Um, so there are families right now who are accessing a variety of childcare services because they're actually unable to afford regulated center-based care. They can't access it. They don't have a space. There's nothing around them. And so it's important to, to recognize that families don't actually have a choice because they don't have anything to choose from. And they're only going to have things to choose from if, they are, if, if the province is going to invest and, and build a system that is affordable, accessible, inclusive, flexible, um, and is of high quality. 
And I think it's also important um, to think about the differences. Um, and, and, and this was one of the questions that, that we were briefed on is, is that what's the difference between a home daycare, right? And what about, what about these women who are running home daycares? Uh, shouldn't they be able to make a profit? There is a huge difference between a big corporate chain making dollars on the backs of, un, of low waged workers than there is of women providing care in their home. And I think we need to think about these large multinational big box childcare chains that are looking at expansion and saying, well, this is my opportunity to seize the moment, to seize the market and operationalize versus saying, no one's saying that family home childcare is not an option. We're saying that in order to meet the needs of Ontarian families, it needs to be nonprofit childcare expansion. Thank you so much. And 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 Wendy, what are, what are I agree your thoughts? With Sophia. I would agree with her 100%. Uh, when you compare the two, um, as you mentioned, um, home childcare and nonprofit childcare centers that are being regulated, um, you you see there's a difference in the fees that they're even charging, right? The childcare center that my daughter attends. Um, for, for an infant to be in child care, it costs over $2,000. For a toddler to be in child care, it costs $2,000. For preschoolers, it's a little over $1,000 and school age over $600. So you see how much it costs for families in Ontario to pay for child care. That is something that a lot of families, again, like I stress, whether you're marginalized, whether you're from a marginalized group or not, it's a high percentage that you're paying out of your pocket. And when you consider how much you might be making, doesn't matter if you are are you're making a lot of money or you're making very little money. That amount of money, you have to basically um, look at your options in terms of can I pay for my rent? Can I pay for my mortgage? Or can I pay for childcare? So you really have to kind of put on the table, what is it that we can afford? What is it that I can afford? Especially if you're coming from a single um, parent household, what can you afford? And it's a lot of money we're talking here, thousands of dollars per year. So I definitely think that, um, you know, childcare costs need to be, um, you know, decreased cons considerably so that all parents across Ontario can afford uh, quality childcare. Thank you so much for, for that, Wendy. And um, Carolyn, uh, what, uh, you know, what's wrong with parents having choices? <laughs> I think parents should have lots of choices. They should have way more choices than they have now. And that's what a universal childcare system will offer them, um, you know, to echo what uh, Sophia and Wendy have, have said. Um, you know, if you can't find a childcare space and you can't afford a childcare space, or the only child care center uh, in your town um, is, uh, is full, you have no choice, right? If you work on standard hours and you have to cobble together an arrangement, multiple caregivers, what kind of choice do you have? Um, you know, creating hundreds of thousands of new child care spaces across this province over the, the next uh, five years, uh, it will, will create so many more options for families than we have right now, right? Um, and, uh, you know, to speak to the, 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 the profit issue, I think that, you know, that, that is how, you know, the Ford government talks about choice and it is code, um, for, you know, wanting to privatize childcare. And when Ford says he wants no strings attached and Lecce says he wants childcare to be flexible and he wants parents to have more choice, that's what he's talking about, right? Where the market, you know, offers more flavors of ice cream. Um, but, you know, really if uh, if there are three child care centers in your town um, and it turns out they're all owned by Bright Path, what kind of choice did you have? Um, and, you know, I think that that's the risk that we're running here. The the risk of a big box child care takeover um, is is real um, and it's more real than than ever before. Um, you know, these corporations pay attention and when there is public money flowing, they start to circle. And they've been doing that now for the last several years and been trying to expand in Ontario. And, um, you know, that kind of um, expansion would be disastrous um, because, you know, they, they use public money to enrich their shareholders, not to provide quality childcare for our families. And it's not the way that we can have childcare expanding um, in our communities.
shall I hop right in there after Carolyn? Yeah. Uh, I feel I'll start with the choice, the choice conversation. I think, I mean, everyone said it, like what kind of choices are we really talking about here? Because if we're talking about the choice between like what you can afford and what you believe is the best care option for your child, those are two completely different things. And right now parents and families are making choices uh, based on decisions they're forced to make, right? What's located nearby, what can they afford, what's available, not the things that really matter to them, their values and ethics, or even, you know, we're not even talking about culturally based program, you know, French language programs, things that really matter to people, to communities. Those aren't the choices that exist in our current system. And I think that's where we have a lot of work to do to make sure we've got, you know, good choices and that that they're choices that really respond to the communities um, that they're in. Like I like I said, you know, I live in a rural community. There's no licensed childcare. When I was trying to find childcare, I went into a home where there was no high chair and she was going to feed my six month old baby in a reclined position. You know, that was the only choice I had ahead of me. That's not a choice, right? Um, so yeah, I think I think choice matters, but it's the right kind of choices that that parents and families should be able to make. And then I think too, like what's at stake when we're talking about for profit versus not for profit? What's at stake is the experiences of children, the quality of the program, the experiences of the the early childhood educators and the workforce. Um, you know, the biggest cost to a childcare budget is staff. Uh, the best marker of quality is a well-compensated, well-supported, educated staff team who delivers high-quality care and pedagogy. And that's what we should be prioritizing because what's at stake is the experiences that children are having, that families are having. Um, and, and it shouldn't be about padding the pockets of someone else. It should be about investing every dollar we can to make sure that these are the best places they can be. We, we say a lot in our work that childcare is like world making spaces, right? They're ethical and political spaces and what we do matters here with young children and families. Um, and to think that, you know, it's a, it's a business that we can make a buck off of it's just the wrong approach. And I think this is a time where we have an opportunity to think differently about what's at stake, about what we value and about how we move forward. So I, I think when we're thinking about nonprofit versus for-profit, what's at stake, what's at risk, those are the questions we should really be asking. We should be asking them of our government as well and, and you know, demanding some answers. And, uh, you know, thank you so much for that, Alana. And I guess I'll start with you because for the next question, because you have mentioned it a couple of times um, in terms of what we need to do to retain um, early childhood educators um, here in Ontario. Yeah, to retain early childhood educators and to make sure that we attract um, early childhood educators and we pay them fairly. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that, Elena? Yes, happy to talk about that. Um, and I think, you know, the roadmap we wrote with the OCBCC does a good job of, of sort of laying the foundation of how we see uh, what, we, what we need to do to get to a place where everyone working in the sector has decent working conditions and decent pay. And, you know, what's been most important to us in this work is really listening to the experiences of early childhood educators and childcare workers to tell us what, what needs to happen. Of course, I've mentioned it already, wages and compensation are a huge issue, right? 42% of uh, RECEs are making under $20 an hour still. I think it's about 40% of non-ECE staff are making between $15 and $17 an hour. We have a lot of work to do to see wages go up, but it's not just about wages, it's about compensation access to benefits, access to retirement plans, access to unionization. This all really matters for building a strong, uh, well-supported workforce that's you know, going to see their, their profession as their lifelong career. But we also think a lot about decent work standards, right? Access to paid planning time that's collaborative in program where educators can come together and talk about what's happening in their rooms and what matters to children and families. It's um, access to professional learning, 
meaningful professional learning during their paid working hours, not on the weekends in their pajamas. It's access to communities of practice to connect with other professionals and, and share you know, strategies and grow together. Um, so I think we have a lot of work to do to, to build out um, these requests, but to really say like wages, wages and working conditions are where we need to start, um, but it doesn't end there. And, you know, this is what the workforce is telling us we need, and this is exactly what we should be listening to and, and putting in place. Thanks. Okay. Uh, can you answer the same question then, Carolyn? Sure, absolutely. I mean, I don't know what I can add on to um, onto, uh, what Alana said, but, and, and also what has been said to answer previous questions about how important the workforce is. Um, and yes, in our, uh, in our roadmap, we make that a central, a central part. Um, we're not going to be able to achieve, um, you know, a universal childcare system without treating the childcare workforce as the centrally important uh, people they are. They are what make programs come alive. Otherwise they're just walls um, and, uh, you know, a room full of toys. Um, so it, it's nothing is going to happen uh, without them. And, um, you know, just to, I guess, emphasize a point that Alana made earlier, just, you know, how our current government, not only the provincial government, but I think that many decision makers come at the issue of, um, of the childcare workforce and completely backwards. Um, and there is always so much rhetoric about how are we going to train more ECs to come into the um, into the sector? You know, how are we going to? Should we have bursaries? Should we use this this funding for bursaries or tuition grants? Or or how do we get how do we get more um, more um, not even ECs, but just how do we get more uh, childcare workers in the in the door? Um, and it's just coming at the issue entirely backwards, as Alana said before, until we deal with decent work and pay, um, you know, until we do that, it, you know, we're never going to solve the problem. We could recruit, you know, more and more people and they're not going to stay in the sector. That three year number that Alana mentioned, that that's, that's how long people stay working in licensed childcare, that's what has to change. And we will not change it until we have decent work and pay for educators. Um, I want to thank everybody for um, what you have spoke to um, tonight about the retainment for early childhood educators. And, uh, you know, Carolyn, I'll start with you, because uh, the you talked about your roadmap and the Ontario Coalition for Better Child Care's roadmap. Can you talk to me about some of the pillars of that roadmap and uh, what it is that you would like the document to give to uh, Doug Ford since you've done the work. Can you share with our um, people that are joining us tonight who may not be familiar with the work that you've done about what it is that we need to, to really do here in Ontario? Sure, um, absolutely. Um, so the roadmap was developed, um, you know, following the federal announcement of the, a $30 billion um, program of, uh, to fund uh, childcare. Um, Child Care Now, which is the, the um, Child Care Advocacy Association of Canada, which brings together child care advocates from all across the country, um, encouraged provincial child care groups to develop roadmaps for what, how the, the federal plan could work in their, um, in their jurisdictions, how it could best work, how this could happen. Um, and as I think Sophia mentioned at the beginning, um, you know, Child Care Now also has a federal um, uh, roadmap and, and framework. So here in Ontario, um, the Ontario Coalition for Better Child Care and the Association for Early Child Educators um, held a series of consultations with our members and allies and uh, partners around the province to talk about um, what we saw as being our vision for child care. Um, how could this work here in Ontario? Um, and we developed this roadmap fairly quickly because, um, you know, we knew that negotiations were going to be going on and we wanted something in hand that we could speak to and say, you know, this is how we think uh, this could this could work here in Ontario. So it, um, if folks go visit the um, childcareontario.org slash roadmap, um, you'll find the whole document. There's also uh, one 
um, key diagram that I think lays out exactly how we see this, um, which is that there's system building elements um, that, you know, sort of draw together um, the system um, of childcare and, you know, principles like that it enshrines the right of all young children to access um, regulated, inclusive, and culturally safe early learning and childcare and embedding anti-racism and anti-oppressive frameworks and pedagogy across the um, childcare system. You know, that's the, the sort of system building space. And then of course there comes the funding and that we need full and sufficient operational funding for childcare programs to function. And that addresses the issues of affordability and workforce, right? Because we've known that in a market system, you know, we have high childcare fees and we have low wages, and those are tied by an invisible string. And full and sufficient operational funding is how we solve that problem. And then, of course, if we want to expand the system, we need to have sufficient capital funding to make that happen. And then the three elements that we lay out in the roadmap are a strategy for affordability, which means capping childcare fees at a maximum of $10 a day. Um, and introducing a sliding fee scale because we recognize that, you know, it's not a flat fee is going to work for every family. $10 um, per child would be too much for many families. So we're saying that's the maximum fee and we need to have a sliding fee scale under there to make it affordable for all. Um, of course, a workforce strategy, which we've, we've spoken about, which talks about a salary scale um, for early childhood educators, as well as decent work standards, paid sick days and planning time, um, paid time for professional learning. Um, and then, of course, the expansion piece, which is going to be so important um, to making this happen <laughs> across the province. I mean, when you think about, um, you know, the number of spaces that we're going to need to get to a place where um, child care is accessible to every family that needs it, um, it's, it's going to be a big project, right? And I don't think we should shy away from that, that this is going to be a big, um, big job um, to create enough child care spaces, but it should be I think it should be something that we're excited about and that communities should be excited about. Um, you know, the yeah, thinking about the, the provincial um, fall economic statement just a few weeks ago where they talked about Build Ontario and it was all about infrastructure and it didn't mention a word about how important uh, childcare is. I mean, creating these childcare spaces, that's an infrastructure project and it's going to be one that pays um, back to communities over and over again. Um, so I, that's the last pillar of the roadmap is that we need to have, um, you know, municipal governments, especially engaged with the community in planning, having actually planned expansion for childcare programs in their communities. Um, so folks can read the roadmap and, uh, you know, our um, advocacy efforts right now, our campaigns um, are to the, the Ford government to sign the childcare agreement, number one, but also to commit to the principles of the roadmap and to consulting the sector um, in making this happen. Thank you uh, so much for that, Carolyn. And I have had a chance to read the roadmap document and um, I do appreciate the work that the coalition has put into that because it really does give us an excellent framework to hold the government accountable uh, to make sure that they're implementing, you know, that, that um, the childcare system right because if you you have to you have to do it right, and the investments have to be on the front end. Uh, Sophia, what are other provinces doing? What are their uh, childcare advocates advocating for um, across the country? Um, how are governments responding? Um, you know, to to agreements that have already been made. Can you can you talk to me about that a little bit? Sure. So I think at the end of the day, we what we're seeing in in various provinces is we're really having to look at what building a system means and what funding those services mean. So it, we know that it's going to take, you know, transformational system building to put this vision of on average $10 a day childcare that is affordable, accessible, inclusive um, from coast to coast to coast. And we know that. And I think the first step that that provinces and other advocacy organizations and, and research um, and policy organizations and you know, hopefully governments um, are taking into account is that the linchpin to transform this from a market um, to a system, a system that has public funding, public management, public oversight, public infrastructure. And the way that's done, and, and Carolyn talked a little bit about it, is it needs to be operationally funded. 
We need to have capital funding. We need to have sustained ongoing operational funding for services so that it's not dependent um, on parent fees, right? Parent fees um, are the biggest contributor to things like staff wages. And touching on, on a little bit of that, you can't address the Canada-wide staffing crisis that exists without really looking at where is that coming from. Um, without investing in nonprofit care, for-profit childcare has been seen to pay staff less because of their own bottom line, which really exacerbates the recruitment and retention crisis. We're seeing this in the chat where, you know, I think Patricia has been bringing it up a couple of times where you're not paying um, staff well. Um, just because you have high fees doesn't mean it's good quality. And I think the linchpin in that is going to be thinking about how we fund services and the ways in which provinces come to the table and say, this is how we're going to do it. We're going to operationally fund. You're going to get capital grants. It's going to be different than the patchwork piecemeal that exists today. Um, and like Alana and Carolyn have said, you know, at the core of that is the workforce and wages and working conditions and decent work environments. And that needs to be done through directly funding wages, uh, determined through uh, provincial wage, gr wage grids and consistent pay for educators, um, similar to the way that you would say um, education workers um, are, are paid. Um, you know, they, you, we want to ensure that each province has a development, has developed and implemented a workforce strategy. And I think at the end of the day, Funding services helps to build a more stable workforce rather than stimulating, like Carol, like Alana has said, a low wage female precarious one via this idea of a cash for care model uh, where you're paying for a service. Thank you so much uh, for that, uh, Sophia. Really appreciate it. Um, Wendy, I'll, I'll go to you and, um, you know, your biography talks about being uh, a parent advocate in the uh, Toronto area. So can you share with me some of the conversations that you have been having with other, uh, other peers and um, what their concerns might be with respect to how childcare will be implemented uh, here in Ontario? I did a poll. <clears throat> Sorry about that. I did a poll uh, a couple of weeks ago on our Facebook page, uh, Toronto Parents for Child Care, and I asked, what is a uh, important issue in child care uh, today that parents are, are, are facing? And a lot of parents, uh, you know, at least one particular parent that stood out to me, she said that, you know, decent work and pay is important to her, but also um, affordability. And I think affordability is a really main issue for a lot of parents because a lot of parents they see now, when you think of this pandemic and everything that has arisen um, throughout the last 19 months, you see that a lot of parents are not just paying for food, which has increased for a lot of parents. The, the you know, the cost of milk and bread and all that um, sort of thing is, has increased, but also um, them having to buy safety supplies. They're having to buy masks now. So they have to take money out their budget to buy masks, to buy hand sanitizer, to buy alcohol, to buy all those things that now they're sending their children to school with. They're sending their uh, children to school with extra napkins or extra wipes or hand sanitizer that they can put on their backpacks. And then of course, when they are picked up and they go to childcare centers, um, they might be there, whether it be for the morning or, in the, or for the afternoon, um, you know, parents are having to deal with a lot in terms of how much um, is coming out of their end um, for for services that or for products and things that they're providing for their children. So um, to answer your question, I think that, uh, you know, a lot of parents, they're they're dealing with a lot and a lot of parents seem to have similar um, experiences when it comes to what's happening in child care. It's not an isolated situation for sure. Um, many parents, just like myself, and I'm sure every everyone else here, um, the panelists that are here uh, alongside me, might have the same experiences that now you're trying to take money out, out of your budget. You're trying to figure out how can I make ends meet? And I think that's a huge issue for a lot of us. 
Thank you so much for that, Wendy. And, and I guess I'll ask our listeners here to also go to your Facebook page um, as well. I know I had mentioned the two earlier ones. So it's Toronto Parents for Child Care. Um, please go to that Facebook page as well and see how you can get involved in advocacy efforts, particularly in the GTA. And I just want to follow up, uh, Wendy, you know, when, you, when you're talking to parents, and I know that people are tired and they're stretched thin. I had mentioned earlier, you know, juggling all of the things um, that we do to try and maintain a home. What are parents collectively doing to, um, you know, hold Doug Ford accountable or, or what, what is it that they're saying, you know, um, within your advocacy group? Um, you know, what, what are you collectively saying um, as a group of parents? Sorry, can you repeat that question again, Martha? Sorry. Um, you know, parents are, are juggling all kinds of, of different things and, and they know that, you know, child care is uh, certainly an important concern, but, you know, like you said, juggling, uh, just budgeting, you know, day-to-day -day expenses. What specific things are parents doing within your advocacy group to push back against the government or to ensure that um, uh, they are advocating for, for quality child, um, child care here in Ontario? Well, I think some parents, what they're doing, and I can't speak for all, but for some parents that I have been in contact with, I think a lot of them are just trying to be keen on the issues and trying to figure out what is really happening. Some of them, they want to hear a little bit more. They want to learn about how they could be involved. They want to hear about what's really happening. Where do they go? What do they do next? And of course, research, we always say research, 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 especially if you don't understand something, right? But I think that now, especially uh, with everything that the Ontario Collision for Better Child Care has been doing, um, you know, I, I've explained to them that there's a roadmap that they can go and they can look at to find more information. There's the website that gives them, um, you know, details of how they can sign the petition. There's so much uh, ways that they can be able to advocate for themselves and for their families and for their communities as well. But I think that right now they're really just keen on trying to learn more. And I think that, um, and that's a good step. And I think that parents that are doing that right now, I commend you because that shows that you're interested in learning about how you can make a difference in your child's um, your child uh, child's life, I would say as well, because at the end of the day, like Alana has mentioned earlier, uh, the children are the ones that are being impacted. And I think that's, that's a main focus here. Thank you uh, so much for that. Um, so I will just turn it over to maybe each one of you in no particular order. I promise, Sophia, I won't make you go first. <laughs> um, we are, we have exhausted uh, the questions that uh, I had sent all of you. And I do appreciate um, the very thoughtful responses that you have provided. So um, I'll turn it to each of you and you can talk about, you know, just uh, maybe provide some concluding remarks to um, our observers and maybe use that opportunity to um, um, insert a specific ask um, as we continue to uh, advocate for childcare here in Ontario. So Alana, I will go to you. Pressure, pressure <laughs> first with, with, a, with an ask. Um, <laughs> I wanna just, if I start, um, my internet seems unstable, so apologies in advance if I just disappear. Um, I don't even know where to begin. I think really what we have in front of us right now is the biggest opportunity we've had in decades, of course. Uh, no surprise to anybody here. Um, I think this is a time where we really have to come together as a sector. You know, we at the ACO, we've been trying to build a collective voice of VCEs and childcare workers for the last seven years, really intentionally bringing their experiences and stories directly to policymakers and making sure they see themselves in, in the policy recommendations we're making. And, you know, over the last 18 months, alongside the coalition, we've produced a number of reports and recommendations. And, and I would say it's been the most frustrating time because we're not getting the we're not getting the response. These voices aren't being heard, um, and our workforce isn't being respected. And that tells me that our children and our families and our communities aren't being respected either. Uh, so I think it's it's really important that this is a time where we come together and we we do continue to build a strong collective voice and we work 
um, as a cohesive unit. You know, what parents can do is what early childhood, early childhood educators can do is what community members and allies can do. And we, we have to just keep putting the pressure on uh, the government and, and do it publicly to hold them to account. Because at the end of the day, you know, regardless of the federal deal, childcare is still their responsibility. They still owe it to children and families and communities and educators to do better. And we can't let them forget that. Um, so I think if I had an ask, I would say, join us. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of exciting advocacy happening and there's ways to participate in whatever way makes you comfortable. Um, but we need to do this together and your voice matters, your experiences matter, and they're really what's gonna um, drive this home. So yeah, I'll stop now. <laughs> Thanks for that. Uh, Wendy, do you have any concluding comments or any asks of uh, uh, people joining us here on the webinar tonight? Uh, I would like to just say that there's a quote that I think that everyone should really take in and it's alone we could do so little, together we could do so much and that's from Helen Keller and I think that after tonight's conversation, as you have some downtime, um, sitting at home, laying in your bed, whatever that might look like for you, for you to take the time to really think about some of the things that we spoke about tonight and for you to really think about how you can contribute, whether that be in small ways or in large ways. But I think the first step is if you have access to our social media platforms like Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, um, even our email to reach out to us, to our groups and be able to um, show show how interested you are and, and we can work together and, and trying to move towards change. And I think that that's all that I would ask for the people that are here tonight. And uh, Carolyn, we'll go to you next. Sure. Um, well, first of all, I just want to say to the folks that are um, that are attending tonight, thank you so much uh, for coming out and I know hanging out with us for um, a couple of hours on your Tuesday night. And I think that, you know, just browsing over the participant list, there are so many people that I know our, our community, our childcare community is such a, um, such a tight, um, you know, movement, such a good um, group. And, you know, we have so much strength uh, together and so much depth and so much knowledge, um, you know, all around our, our province and, and in communities. And, you know, I don't think that, you know, the work that we're doing right now is not easy and it hasn't been easy. <laughs> um, you know, this, uh, the current provincial government has never treated childcare as a priority, as I said. And that has meant that the childcare community has had to use every resource, every tactic, every strategy that we have um, to get us where we are today. And, um, but to be in a place after, um, you know, uh, facing the government that we are and with a pandemic on top of it to be in a situation where we have this possibility where there's $10.2 billion that could make such a difference in our communities um, is thanks to the strength of our movement. And, you know, that's why I know that we're going to win this, you know, whether we win it, you know, in a few weeks or, or if it takes months or if it's after June, uh, we're still going to win it. So. Uh, thanks everyone for joining us. Thank you, and uh, and Sophia, um, I will turn it over to you, and and then we'll go to maybe some questions and answers from uh, people that are on the uh, webinar. So uh, you will see a Q and A button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, of your screen, if you would like to ask a question, please uh, type that in the Q and A section and uh, perhaps who your question might be directed to, whether it's a specific panelist or if you would like um, each individual panelist to answer. So uh, thank you and I'll turn it over to you, Sophia. So I don't think I have any more to add just in terms of, of, of thanking, you know, and, and, and what a concluding idea, but I, I am so grateful to have shared space with with these strong women on the panel today, and 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 saying that we are at a pivotal moment, like like we have all said, and Ontario and Canada have an opportunity to really show the rest of the world and show 
Canadians, show Ontarians that we matter. Um, and I think when we think about building a system and we think about ensuring a system that is going to support Canadian families and families in Ontario, we have to think about what is going to be an asset. Um, and the asset that we have is the childcare community. Like Patricia said, we do show up. Um, and so we're asking that have those conversations, talk to people, talk to your MPs. And, and I think the big thing is do the collective work that we've been doing for over 50 years. We need people to join us and we need to have more conversation like this. We need to have conversation with people who don't understand. Um, so my ask would be talk to someone about not-for-profit childcare that has no idea what not-for-profit childcare is um, and get them to start thinking about what this means for Ontario. Thank you uh, so much for that and such thoughtful insight um, from all of you. You know, it has been my absolute honor to sit on this panel and, and to moderate it with all of you strong um, activists. Um, as I described earlier in my opening comments, you know, it, it really has been a movement. It has maybe taken us, as you said, Sophia, 50 years to get to this point, um, but our work isn't done. And certainly by working together, um, we can make, you know, childcare reality here in Ontario where working families do have the ability to know that their children are safe, um, well taken care of in quality childcare system here in Ontario. So I will turn it over to you, Tracy, to um, you know moderate any questions and answers during this period, and um, I'll come back with some concluding remarks. Thanks, Martha. So I don't have any questions in the Q and A, but one of the things that we talked about. Um, that I heard you mention uh, during the, uh, the webinar was, um, okay, so Doug Ford signs this agreement tomorrow. He signs the 10 care, send $10 plan, everything's great. What happens next? What kinds of things do we need to continue to fight for? Um, you also talked about, you know, an election coming up and, uh, you know, we're all going to be going to the polls uh, in Ontario. Um, what sorts of things do we need to look for from political parties um, as far as child care is concerned? And, uh, you know, really, I guess back to my original thing, what, what's next? We, we, or we, our dream's been answered. We, we have universal child care. What's next? Um, I think I'll start with uh, Wendy. I probably would have wanted to pass it on to somebody else, but <laughs> it's okay, Tracy. Um, what's next? I think that really just continuing to hold um, the uh, our governments accountable. I think um, keeping those that are in um, positions of power, keeping them accountable. You know, they say that, yes, we want $10 uh, a day childcare. So that might be um, evident. We'll see that parents are paying that much or up to that much uh, per day, uh, but also making sure that, um, you know, the, the environments that staff are working in, we also want that, you know, staff are getting paid fairly and they might get, they might be, pay, uh, be paid fairly. It might show, uh, it might be demonstrated in their paychecks, but we also wanna make sure that those environments that they work in are safe. We want to make sure that those environments that they work in are um, are ideal. Uh, we also want to make sure that families have access to uh, child care centers and not just be put on a waiting list, right? So we want to kind of hold our governments um, uh, accountable, I would say. Thanks, Wendy. Uh, okay, I'll go to Elena. I was gonna say we take a we're all gonna take a nap. <laughs> we're all gonna celebrate and we're gonna take a nap because everything's gonna be great. But in re reality, <laughs> we might do those things too. But I think, um, I think the work really just begins when we get the deal right. There's a lot of work that uh, has to go into making sure that our workforce strategy and our wage grid, 
you know, like you said, Wendy, really meet the needs of educators and make sure that they have the capacity and the support to do the work that they need to do. Um, and then I think we have a lot of work to do around big ideas, right? We need a system that's going to address racism, settler colonialism, the environmental crisis. Like, how are we taking that up as, as part of early childhood education and care? There's a, a lot of questions we get to begin to answer when we can see the possibility of a public system because the public system will make things possible that are impossible now. Um, so I think, I think it, it's really the starting place. It's opening the gates and, and then we can get going on, on really getting the work done and making sure that the, that the system we build in Ontario is the system that Ontario deserves. Great, thanks, Selena. Uh, someone put in the chat, remember children can't vote and this is going to affect their lives for years, exactly. Uh, Carolyn, do you wanna comment on that? Sure, although I think that Wendy and Alana, I mean, I, I agree with everything you said. And, um, you know, yeah, what comes next if, if Ontario signs on the line? I think that the important thing to remember is that, you know, they've, they've only signed on the line because, you know, we've all spoken up um, and municipalities have spoken up and the business community has spoken up and there is this huge clamor across the province um, telling them they have to sign on, um, that it's unacceptable that they haven't done it. Um, so then you're, you know, we're stuck in a situation where we have a provincial actor that's there kind of unwillingly and whose plan for childcare, we still don't know. Um, you know, if they sign the agreement and we see um, what their action plan is, it may or may not gel with what we've all talked about tonight. And I think that it's going to take, you know, sort of maximum effort from uh, advocates to hold them to account, to, you know, just be on them relentlessly on every aspect of this. And, and that's one of the reasons, as I said earlier, that I am pinning a lot of <laughs> hope, or, um, but responsibility um, and expecting and, and wanting to, I guess, encourage the leadership of municipalities in this. Because I feel like in the, the, the current um, provincial situation we have, um, they're our best bet for this to roll out the way it should. Um, and so I think that, um, you know, if we can add one more thing to people's advocacy to-do list, um, it's, to, it's to be in touch with their municipal leaders. Um, with their counselors, you know, find out who sits on the community development committee or whatever it is that's called and it's all got different names in different municipalities, but be in touch with municipal leaders about this, um, because we're going to need them to step up in a big way. And if I was Doug Ford, I'd be afraid because the women united <laughs> certainly can make great things happen. And who thought in Ontario, we would have a universal child care plan in, in Canada, actually. Um, it's pretty pretty exciting that we're on the cusp of this. Uh, Sophia, do you have anything to add to uh, what your colleagues have said? Yeah, I think just, uh, you know, Amanda touched on it in, in, in the chat is that the work doesn't stop, it really just changes. Uh, we've been doing this for 50 years and, and I haven't been doing this for 50 years, but I'm privileged to work alongside people who have. Um, and I think, like Carolyn said, it there's more work to be done. We're not going to wake up and it's not going to be universal child care. It's not going to be what we think it's going to be on you know January 1st. That's not what it's going to be. That's not the reality. The work changes. It doesn't stop. And we need more people to engage in these conversations. Um, and that, that, that's really all I have to add. Thank you so much. Okay, so I don't see any more questions in the Q&A or in the chat. So I'm going to turn it back to Martha for some closing comments. Thank you so much, Tracy. And, and again, thank you to all the panelists for joining us uh, this evening to talk about what a universal childcare system means for working families, as I've said, here in Ontario. Um, I draw so much inspiration from each one of you. Um, the, you're right, the work is never done. 
and uh, you know we're going to continue to move forward and we're going to continue to move forward together to ensure that the public services that we have here in Ontario remain public, remain accessible and remain affordable for working families. And OSSTF is alongside um, you each step of the way. Know that we um, believe in, in quality childcare and we are a partner uh, with each one of you to make sure that that happens. So we need to continue the conversation. It doesn't end with this webinar tonight. Um, I know that all of you have been in contact with, uh, you know, Tracy before. And if there's anything that you need from OSSTF FASO, please reach out. Um, we will do everything that we can to amplify uh, the work that you're doing to ensure that childcare, um, universal childcare becomes a reality here in Ontario. So. Thank you again. Thank you again so much. It's been my honor to moderate tonight with uh, all of you. And uh, thank you very much for coming. That concludes our webinar. Thank you everyone for participating and to the panelists for joining us this evening. And thank you to Martha for, despite technical issues, the incredible job of moderating. Take care, everyone. Stay safe and have a great night. Bye for now.